Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. My name is Zach and I am your leftist uh, companion through tonight, the world of new urbanist memes. And joining me tonight is going to be Dan Platt of the Three Left Show podcast, a very great podcast you all should check out. And we are going to be digging into uh, a bunch of videos dealing with new urbanism. Um, for those unfamiliar, new urbanism is uh, it's it, kind of an amorphous theory. Like there's no real clear dividing lines of, of what is and is not, but it includes things that people, uh, planners, usually city planners, have found uh, help create more livable, more interconnected, uh, more vibrant cities. So that can be anything from transit to uh, farmer's markets to community gardens to mixed-use developments, all sorts of things. So we're going to dig into to that sort of thing tonight and have some fun doing it as well. I'm going to go ahead and give Dan a call, and we'll get this thing rolling right now. All right, wonderful. Well, welcome to the show. Let me turn. There we go. Is it a good volume now? Yeah, that looks pretty good from my end. So. Okay, good. Yeah. Very much. My audio should my audio quality should be a bit better. Um, I had a friend um, crimp the jack for the mic. Oh, okay. I see. All right. Well, let me just uh, share my. Good screen. to be back. Yeah, good. To, good to good to have you back. How have you been lately? Uh, just fine. Uh, move, just moving along through summer, um, working as little as possible, living the <laughs> well, bohemian you. life. Um, I have, I didn't start the gardening, but, uh, on the garden project side, I helped harvest a plot of flax that was oh. planted as an experiment. So it's not full permaculture garden, but we have a plot of flax. So we will, uh, you know, the, one of the just retired, uh, state workers who's, you know, he's a, he's a socialist like us and, but just retired. So he wants to garden, right. And farm. Uh-huh. And it was his idea to start, like, I want to grow flax. I've been watching these videos, and I want to see if we can actually develop the pi fibers and make uh, fiber weaving and do, you know, make a placemat. At least that's my idea. I'd wow. like to make a placemat. But anyway, place maybe we'll have enough fiber to make some friendship bracelets. <laughs> well, now that would be worthwhile then. So we harvested it, and now we're, it's in the drying stage, and there's a lot of other steps before you turn something that grows into something that you, a material to make things with. That's very exciting. That, that sounds yeah. like uh, you really get to know the, the whole process start to finish and get a much better appreciation for what uh, manufacturers go through, or at least what they went yeah. through when things were more often handmade. Well, we, we also were using very clay uh, based soil, it was not good soil. So like uh -huh. it only grew three feet tall and wouldn't get any taller. Oh, that's too bad. And uh, but we've always had a, a flock of sheep. Uh huh. Uh, that we've been harvesting wool from. Harvesting wool. And because uh, wow. they've been like tamping down, what, basically it's a baseball field. And the idea is that after maybe a decade of having sheep tamp it down and mm -hmm. graze on it, that it will be broken up enough that you, we could actually grow real food on it. Otherwise, we'll just kind of we're piling compost into rows. And making beds out of that. Oh, that's cool. In this case, it wasn't a bed; it was just the ground. Well, that's cool. That, that that's cool that you uh, are are allowing things to to kind of happen slowly. That, that that sounds like a very permaculture concept of, of using small and slow solutions, using the the animals to to break up the the soil for you. So that's very cool. Yeah, there's a there's some really good videos. Uh, now I did uh, watch a good amount of. Or at least listen to the first half of last week's show, and where you just listen to the conclusion of Conquest of Bread, yeah. and then you did two hours of permaculture talk. Yeah. And uh, my introduction to permaculture, as it wasn't called it, but it was in. So I'm not just an architect. I went to school. I took history courses, and one of them was the environmental history of South America. Oh, cool. And so we covered at one point the Amazonian kind of gardening by native tribes where because they had such dense, it's like a, 
a 30, you know, a 10 by 20 foot plot, mm-hmm. you know, kind of digged out from, from in the in the understory of the rainforest. And everything is planted. You have all these different plantings that are so dense and basically everything's growing off of each other. Uh-huh. You have various plants that are vines and they're growing on the trees and then things on the ground. And it's basically everything you kind of talked about probably. Right, yeah. yeah. And it's so low maintenance once it's grown in that it's like maybe an hour of labor a day Oh wow! to basically grow enough food for, you know, a family of six. Man, that, that is the dream. Uh-huh. That's, that's wonderful. And it reminds me of uh, some contemporary permaculture video channels mm-hmm. where the guy is showing step by step kind of his backyard that's slowly turned into a food forest, I guess, where again, he has, you know, Everything is growing into each other because the thing about weeds mm-hmm. and the light labor needed to garden properly where oh, we got to weed all the all the time and right. water. If you weeds grow where where there's any open space, wherever there's something not growing. Right. And the thing about weeds is that like, they grow in roughly like man made spaces. So if you fill in the growing area mm-hmm. with basically um, completely covered with planting, mm-hmm. where even like any any extra space you put garlic in, which is what we're doing at the kind of other farm, the real farm area that we, oh, cool. the community project has going. And they harvested like a uh, hundred bulbs of garlic oh, wow. just last week, nice. and uh, but they're gonna replant them or replant more mm-hmm. in in the row as they plant in something for the rest of summer. Um, because the more they plant in, double up the rows, triple up the rows, there's nowhere for the weeds to grow. Yep. Yeah, you fill every and, inch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is, uh, I mean, that, that relates to the, uh, um, the idea that uh, pretty much everyone knows, that, that uh, nature abhors a vacuum. So any, any space that, that is disturbed soil or, or a sunny edge of a woodland or something like that, nature views that as, as a vacuum, so it will do whatever it can to fill that space, usually with weeds, which, which tend to be the, the pioneer species, the ones that are best adapted to these rugged conditions. So Yeah, they, they are explicitly, like certain qualities of pigeons and other anim, uh, urban animals, mm-hmm. they explicitly evolve and adapt to man-made areas. So it's interesting, I read a book about, like, it was like weeds, a history. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of about how, like, for most of American history, not American, human history, weeds have always been like this thing of the devil and like a bane on our existence. Right. Um, and, but they're basically growing wherever we're doing stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Funny. And so, like, that's why a lot of weeds have names like the devil's paw, the devil's vine, the devil's this, the devil's that, devil's mm-hmm. kiss, devil's... Um, rim and <laughs> let's see uh-huh. so that's just one that was one chapter about naming and then there's another about like kind of kind of makes you think about invasive species and what's really invasive what counts as that absolutely um what's was conservation really about and because yeah because it's kind of like a, a reversing attitudes about things that are like like think like think of weeding as like crime, mm-hmm. and instead of seeing it as a structural issue of like the plantings are too far apart, mm-hmm. or maybe we need to put down proper paths in mm-hmm. our garden, um, or you know just plant certain things, or have certain bugs around that attack certain these the species of weed and not the um, food food plants mm-hmm. but you know the three sisters is about that where you plant squash beans yep, absolutely beans fix nitrogen you, you talked about all this yeah yeah so it's cool stuff but we can go from there so um i'm thinking we move on from the last time we talked right and streamed we covered pencil towers oh. from hr uh honker yeah, yeah and i think we could either we either go forward so, yeah, so I shared uh, three videos with you. One is about brutalist architecture. I think that can go later. Uh-huh. 
but I think the two about tall uh, skyscrapers. Yeah, you want to do you start um, with those? Yeah. So how about the one that's why skyscrapers are bad? Okay. That one, yeah. Why China? Whoops, there we go. Why we shouldn't? Yeah, yeah. And then, then we'll cover why China has now banned them. Yeah, that, that, that was I think, shocking you know, to hear. But this is kind of a reason. This goes over the reasons why one would want to ban skyscrapers so it doesn't sound yeah. like some crazy authoritarian double no. think <laughs> welling in policy no I, you know I, the freedom to have tall buildings i mean it's your god it's our god-given right to have you know tall yeah. wing buildings tall as tall as we can possibly make it you know the, the limits yeah. of the human imagination all that stuff that the absurdity of um of the pencil towers yeah uh, yeah well topic. from 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 that video the pencil towers one i can i can guess why china has gone ahead and banned skyscrapers and why they're not generally a good thing to they're have. not wanted <laughs> yeah well they're, they're not wanted and it, it seems like more than anything they they serve as a tool for land speculation and and storage of wealth in in something mm -hmm. that's gonna uh increase with inflation rather than than yeah. decrease so that that would be it, my it's, guess but let's yeah. let's let's it's get a very it. marxist take to say like because the chinese economy has finally started to slow down in growth mm-hmm that the government has, on a, almost on a dime, switched gears and said, like, okay, now the economy's not growing anymore. We're not going to, like, worry about these capitalist concerns, and we're just going to, like, act like we're just going to go all the way towards, like, social responsibility or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a positive spin on it anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that definitely sounds like a better sense than, than what our policymakers would uh, all right, use. Let's get to it. Yeah, let's get to it. Skyscrapers are the symbol of wealth and modernity. They dominate the skyline to the point where they become intrinsic to a city's image. Investors, politicians and the general public seem to be loving them. And why wouldn't they? Skyscrapers are big and shiny, usually at least, and a true status symbol. And I am here to ruin the fun and tell you why skyscrapers are actually pretty stupid and why we shouldn't build them. My view is that in 99.9% .9 of the cases you do- We're snowflakes? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're we're, we're ruining the fun. Oh, right? yes. Right, you know, because right. like as as a kid, of course, like all kids, probably, I as a kid who loved buildings, I love skyscrapers, right? Oh, for sure. I was sure. Uh, not obsessed, but like I really um, admired, you know, charts of to of tallest buildings in the sure. world and and uh, and those factoids. And like you have games like Sim Tower. Yeah. Or that. when you play Sim City, it's almost like the goal is to it's like the end state, yeah. get the end state is to have a down like a section of the city where it's really tall because that means you've kind of like developed your city enough mm -hmm. that it's so that the land value is high enough that the whatever developer is in the zoning allows uh, have built tall buildings. Yeah, yeah, and and that really went uh, nuts with the the last installment of Sim City when they had the mega towers, which were just you know they on, added those uh, yeah they added mega towers which were on beyond any you know they, they, they had uh the landmarks like they had an empire state building for size comparison and these these mega towers that you could build just just dwarfed it completely it was probably three or four right. times larger pretty ridiculous um but I, have, yeah. I have as years go by i have less and less interest in most city building games yeah well, the, uh, the, the exception for me right now is tropico Tropico, like, yeah, yeah, that yes. definitely is a city building game for sure. But it injects the politics as well as yeah, the actual fun. industrial chain. That, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, there's um, what is it, City Skylines? That's that's the more popular one among yeah. planners and, and architects right now. A lot more customizable, anyway. Right. If you put in all the mods, then I, yeah. I'm sure it's it's way more engaging because you can do mixed use or something like that. But I yeah, haven't seen that, that much even then. Um. But just the fact that you have to buy DLC to like have a park, <laughs> like like a oh park wait that really? There's no stock parks that come with that that game. Well, they're all like squares, you know. Oh, you can't okay. have like really you can boring, have all really these boring. curved roads, but no curved parks. Uh, I see. Wow. Yeah, someone needs to come out with a, a new urbanist spin on on a city planning game. That would be pretty interesting. Mm. Or or like well, a solar was, punk one. That'd be cool I was, too. I was halfway through. I basically have a rough draft of an essay I was writing about like my thoughts on city builders mm -hmm. and the basically the ones I've played and I do a compare and contrast. It's that kind of essay mm -hmm. kind of like you would be assigned for a regents test 
in high school, but um, but much longer. <laughs> and mm, sorry, yeah, blew out the mic. And oh, no problem. Uh, was oh yeah that um, kind of like this one essay about like Age of Empires where like if you play the game long enough and there's a stalemate between players, mm-hmm. you just end up using all the resources, right? And everything just stops. Oh yeah. Right, and then like, what's there to do? Like, what are you fighting over? Like, what's the oh, that's for sure. actual goal? You know, and and with these city planners, it's like that you have you're the infinite godlike city planner, and you never have to actually ask for consent from the population. You just do stuff. Yeah, it's just you and know, carte blanche, eminent domain. It, it's and, and the fact that like, you have this, it's always a capitalist system for sure. Although there are the niche ones where they're trying to do a socialist version usually you know command economy stuff yeah which is of course tropico kind of fits in mm-hmm. but it's honest about it and it makes fun of it at the same yeah. time yeah there's a lot of humor in that one for sure and but yeah like oh there was this there's one game called urban empire made by some some uh slavs i don't know what co- actual mm. country um but I don't know about that one. it's it's the first game where you actually have to ask for permission from a city council to mm. that has parties, by the way, because um, oh. you start in like, 1850 and you move forward through time and, wow. and the parties change every 40 years uh-huh. and they all have different like, you know, biases where it's like, OK, you want to expand the city. The this party will love that. But this party actually doesn't want that. Hmm. And you have to manage the council as much as you're managing the finances. Wow problem with the game is that it was completely broken on the financing side where there are all these things that a, a city a mayor or a planner would never have to actually like pay for oh, okay. like uh, churches you would have to maintain churches and the maintenance costs oh. were just not balanced oh. for the revenue that would be brought in th- from any growth yeah so and then there would be actual because it's really in line with history that there would be an economic crash and then half of your businesses would just shut down so for 10 years and wow. thus no you'd be in the red the whole time wow which is something that like you don't get in skylines where like the years tick by uh-huh. but the economy is just completely stable yeah and thus the fantasy of it now, of course, that's the definitely fantasy, the fantasy but, of it especially but, but it kind places. of it doesn't it doesn't put it in a in a setting where it's like this is fantastic mm-hmm. that this is actually not how things work. Yeah, it, it, it's it's projecting itself as as I would a not use it as a teaching tool. But uh, but yeah, it, it glosses over a bunch. Yeah, there was uh, the same problem with the the mechanics in um, the recent Sim City too. Like, uh, um, yeah, there's there's no outside. This is the new economy. version that isn't uh, it isn't just limited to one little square. Uh, the, the same city one yeah yeah um it's it was that was one of the problems with the game too is that it's it is uh it gave you very little land to work with and there was uh once you okay had, this is yeah once you had any top it was i think uh 2013 was when it came out and uh yeah you're talking about that one i yeah. thought there was be there would be another one by now yeah i you know i thought so too um that ea would like okay we messed up that one it mm-hmm. was the first one of the few it was the first times we did always DRM, mm-hmm. and it was a disaster. Yeah, uh, they they came out with a few expansion packs in, in the subsequent years, uh-huh. but but that's really all they've added to it. So, mm. I think they've just concentrated all their their efforts on The Sims, uh, mm. and and I guess that just became a more profitable franchise. Unfortunately, yeah, I put I put money into it in a um, uh, it was a a Kickstarter uh-huh. kind of city game. But the thing with a lot of the potential in the city builders is that they actually like make it about more control, mm-hmm. um, more like, oh, the, in our version, we'll allow you to assign the actual units per plot. Uh huh. And I'm like, mm, I actually kind of want there to be less control, like with things. Like there needs to be more like AI governance or something. Mm-hmm. AI um, governance. Or in a similar way, the Tropico does this where, like, you have requests. Oh, sure. Instead yeah. of just, like, 
you're deciding who gets the water and, and how they get the water and mm -hmm. and whatnot. Like I like in Tropico, it's, it's it's caricatures, but like you have like a environmental party person who's the faction that's environmental and they're like a, a flower child. And then yeah, you right. have industrialist who's like a, a southern like, I say, I say, I say, <laughs> uh, I think we should build more steel plants. Yeah. Um, go on. That's funny. That's a lot of funny. Uh, oh boy! First, first comment of Too the many night. Can't. Uh, neo neoliberalism forever. Oh, I sure hope not. I, I mean, I don't think neoliberalism is uh, really deep throwing know. that boot there. Yeah, I don't think it's really destined, or it's not I really long for this world. Just, someone's just baiting. But yeah, well, well, I'm sure that's it's easy, too easy. Yeah, it is. It is pretty easy. Yeah, Wheel, wheels are kind of falling off on the, the neoliberal uh, experiment. Um, and that's another another thing we could talk about tonight is is the uh, the lifting of the housing, or, or the rent um, moratorium. The memorandum. Yeah, well, the Congress has done nothing to to stop. I've um I think it's different state by state. Like it is I think state York, by state for sure. New York has a separate memorandum that's right. kind of like whenever it doesn't have a deadline, it's whenever we kind of say it's done. Um, though maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's just my wishful thinking that I don't want things to fall apart in my, where I live. Yeah. No, I, I know um, Minnesota still has, uh, the moratorium in, in effect in the, in the state, but I was looking through that someone put up a, a matrix of, of all the different states. And I, I bet you could guess which states don't have any safety net, uh, now that, that people mm -hmm. are, are starting to pay rent on. Why is the ones that are starting to have spikes of the variant? Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, they're just really deciding to compound all their problems at once. So, yeah. Just I think that this, this might be, you know, instead of it being like flipping climate change, but uh -huh. I mean, climate change is kind of, you know, a key cause of all this as well. Oh, for sure. In the background. The movement of peoples out of these... Um, cluster fuck states and and into the quote-unquote blue states um mm -hmm. but we'll have to see mm -hmm. but because people have over, already been moving around a lot during yeah. the pandemic yeah that's um, true that's true yeah it's it's thrown a lot of things into to start contrast but like i can point out in ifica new york Mm -hmm. that uh, they have a good anarchist presence. It's where a lot of colleges are, so you have a lot of radical students there and uh, an alumni. And they have a more stringent memorandum mm -hmm. on rents, on rent paying. Not just a eviction memorandum, but rent memorandum. But maybe that was something proposed, but maybe it was just sort of de facto. Are you, are you talking about getting assistance with with rent payments and late payments? And no, no, that, that you just weren't required to pay rent. Oh, you just weren't required. So to. there was a lockdown. Got it. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, just before we move on, I wanted to mention that that I finally have a uh, chat bot that I've I've uh, led into the stream. So I have a night bot that will uh, um, do all the functions that that a lot of the bigger streams do. So I can finally do shout outs and and you know link to my stuff and all that sort of thing too. Okay, uh, so Spitfire three six 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 asks if sex ed should be taught in schools. Not really the topic right now, but but oh, and then you go into some other details. Depending on the state, it already is. So yeah. I'm not sure that's not really a question. Yeah, I it's think not really a real question. It's not a relevant question to this year. Yeah. I think maybe a better question is like, how do you feel sex ed should be taught, or what grade do you want to start sex ed? Which as far as New York standards are concerned, it starts in middle school. Cool. Basically with the um, how to put on a condom. Yeah. Yeah, I think it starts in, in elementary school in Minnesota here. Where that's what, fourth, fifth grade, something like that, maybe even third, where they just start, you know, explaining the birds and bees and stuff like that. This is definitely a troll post, so um, Spitfire yeah. 366. Whatever, six, six, but you know what? It's a simple but, enough uh, question. Yeah, for sure. So I, I like sex ed. Um even if you're talking you're cities, ask us a city dumb question. Jokes about it. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk, let's talk about cities. In fact, let's move on with the video right now. I mean, we could talk about like sexless bathrooms. If we want. <laughs> sure. That that definitely. I mean, that is kind of a, a city planning issue. 
that definitely could do with uh you could have to do with ordinances for businesses and stuff like that for sure <laughs> wow <laughs> okay anyway let, let's move on in the video here don't even need to go above 10 floors. And so let's examine the main problems with skyscrapers that prevent them from being a good idea. Problem number one is their environmental impact, because turns out a big hunk of glass and metal is hard to cool or heat. And to quote this Guardian article about it, electricity use per square meter of floor area was nearly two and a half times greater in high-rise office buildings, 20 or more stories, than in low-rises, six stories or less. The gas used for heating was about 40% more for tall buildings, and the total carbon emission from these buildings was twice as high. But hang on a second, you might say. It is entirely possible to build environmentally friendly skyscrapers that aren't just a big mass of steel and glass. To which I say, sure, but it still doesn't solve the second problem, cost. In general, the taller you build, the more expensive it gets. And this is a problem, because that means affordable housing and affordable office space are out the window. If big investors put up a bunch of money to build a skyscraper, the first thing they will want is returns. And that usually doesn't mean affordable one or two room apartments. If the just just another aside with the, the cost there too if you have a, a so-called green skyscraper where there's you know trees and bushes and, and and that sort of thing poking out of every nook and cranny you have to beef up the uh, structure of it a whole lot more because those things weigh a lot and you have to account for the the water that's going to uh, come in and out of the system at various times so you're, you're having to overbuild these buildings a whole lot more if you're going to have that level of green infrastructure. You have them be like a vertical forest. Vertical type forest, of, yeah. Type uh, thing. Pseudo solar punk um, pictures or right. maybe at least ecotopia. But this is going to the fact that any high rise is not ecological. Right. Um, which is kind of important to get across. One side um, topic is that of elevators. I got into some arguments or two about elevators not being green uh now, of course they whatever in certain facilities or buildings they should be necessary to accommodate the handicapped for sure or the seniors but otherwise we shouldn't have a lot of buildings that rely on elevators uh for uh circulation uh, why well elevators um for or even even a low-rise building make up five percent of the energy use um they idle they use a lot of energy when they're in motion mm -hmm. there are more efficient models um but it's still kind of a large piece of machinery it is. with a lot of moving parts and and that's kind of something about like when you have ecological towers is that it's so ver you're over complicating it right um, because it is in fact a big machine even if it has living components in uh -huh. that doesn't make it a living machine no, that's very true that's very true and uh yeah one, once you get above really more like uh three to, to five stories you, you're, you're pretty well dependent on elevators to be running constantly in order to mm. or three but you yeah know. yeah yeah even even three stories especially no, when i will you're... mention that um uh, the other topic is the the rooms mm -hmm. that uh, most of these buildings are high-rise residences or one of the things that puts the crunch on on housing costs is that the, a lot of what's built is one to two bedrooms mm -hmm. and that there's a complete lack of three or more bedrooms yeah so if you have a family with more than one kid mm -hmm. um and you want to have an extra space for office or library or whatever mm -hmm. um, or you just have two kids then you're kind of shit out of luck in most cities. That's true. Three bedrooms are really hard to get. That, that's There's just true. not a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, very true. Because no new ones are built. You're kind of relying on older stock, which could be renovated and thus more expensive that way, mm -hmm. or it's tenements, and it's like you're in slum right. territory. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I, I suppose it has to do with just uh, the return on investment, why there's not more of those uh, being built new. W would you say that's true? Well, there's, there's, I guess there's, there's certain reasons for why uh, developers don't b build a lot of three bedrooms. They actually almost have to be mandated to build three bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So or like they need to be mandated to build, quote unquote, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Um. Part of it is, yeah, you just you fit more units when it's one to two bedrooms, right. and the rich or the afford, you know, people who can afford.
afford any new apartment uh, don't have a large family. And as soon as they do have a family, they're buying some suburban house. Mm -hmm. So some other more wasteful type of housing that is, of course, a quarter million dollars at least. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I can definitely get behind that. It, yeah, it definitely is a uh, um, quote unquote lower lower classes that that tend to fall uh, or structure themselves more in the uh, extended family sort of model. Yeah, because if we're talking about like urban centers, then yeah, like young professionals or people who mm-hmm. don't have a family, and if they do, then they're in a McMansion. Yeah, because yeah. both are roughly the same cost. Yeah, uh, that's true. That's true. Well, cool. Well, let's move on in the video here a little bit more. The spreadsheet says high-end luxury condos equal most big number, then that's what's getting built. Meaning that for skyscrapers to meaningfully address the housing shortage and not just become a rich people tower, the state would need to step in. But the thing is, if we really put up an affordable residential skyscraper with state support, that still wouldn't eliminate problem number three, alienation. Because turns out living on the 50th floor makes it really difficult to socialize with people. Inside residential towers, there is rarely any meaningful social spaces. If you want any human contact, you have to go down to the park or something. But going down to the park from the 50th floor is not the same as going down to the park from the 5th floor. One takes 5 minutes and the other takes 15. The Mm. lack of quick and easy access to a social space promotes alienation. People will just stay in their apartments, they will not get to know each other. Here, the best case scenario is some people on the same floor kind of knowing each other. Whereas if you spread things out into a nice low rise uh, area with plenty of... Go for it. So one um, kind of as a designer, I've come across certain ideas of how to remedy this, where you have tall buildings uh, with less alienation. So the first comes from Cobusier himself, where in his Unity Tower in France, um, he had a, what was called like a, a high rise shopping street or like a, a street in the air where on, say, the 10th yeah. floor out of a 20, 15-story building, um, it was basically, think of it like a really a wider hallway that had spaces to hang out mm-hmm. and even uh, places where you could have shops, like little tiny shops, sure. the kind that like take up a 10-by-5-foot box. Yeah. Um, so you have a newsstand that you kind of stop by on your way through the building. Um, certain... Office towers obviously have these too, but they're usually like centered in the lobby of the building. Right. The other the thing that's more high concept and thus like adds another million dollars to whatever we're building is to like maybe every temp floor have a floor that's like a park floor mm-hmm. where it's completely open mm-hmm. or it's um, like it's just the structure and then like um, no gray, no glazing, no anything. So it's like. Oh. It is a floor that's just for hanging out, just for socializing, so that like sky whatever floor you're on, you're roughly three to five floors uh, stairwise from a park, which is kind of similar to the 10-minute rule. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's similar yeah, it to, you know, it would take as long to see in this, uh, in this shot here uh-huh. to get out to some green space. Yeah. But, of course, doing that means... You're not so much adding a lot more engineering, but you're taking a full floor of rentable space and making it non-rentable space. Yeah, you're taking it out of... And there's tons of, like, luxury or really high-concept projects around the world that kind of have these sky parks. Um, But as kind of was pointed out in Honkler's first video, these are private spaces that belong only to the building. Right. And so the socializing is only Semi between the tents. Park, yeah. It's not really a social condenser. Right. Um, yeah. It's not a place you can meet a new neighbor from a different building, for sure. Yeah. Unless it really is like, say, the a Burj Khalifa kind of, you know. Yeah. But he'll this this, this guy gets into it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, my thought on all of that is is why not just take the internal hallways and just turn them out and put them on the outside of the building. So you have layers, basically the same amount of hallway space, it's just now on the outside of the building. And then if your buildings are, are close enough together, you could connect one to another. So it, it, it basically look a lot like a, like a shopping mall, just without the, the roof, you know, so you'd have... Well, that's what, that's what uh, 
Le Corbusier's Unity Tower Unite oh, is it? Okay, project I guess I'm not as kind of did. Like the, the, the shopping street was on one side. Mm-hmm. And if you have a single, it's called like a single slab block where oh. it's one slab of apartments. So you have the um, corridors on one side and the apartments on the other. Sure. But this usually means that you have all this window space that isn't apartments. Mm-hmm. Um, you have all these windows that are just for the circulation, which makes a better circulation, but you usually have a double slab housing block where it's a windowless hallway yeah. um, stacked up with, you know, and then the apartments get maximum light. But that just makes it okay to stay in your apartment all day. Right. Which is kind of a case for why apartments shouldn't be too comfortable. But just comfortable enough, of course. But they don't need to be that big. They don't have to be like the self-contained world. Right. You yeah. want to be you want it to just to. be the sleeping and cooking and reading space. Right. And everything else you do in your life, you do in the surrounding city block. Yeah, yeah. Your your, your public life takes place in, in plazas, parks, cafes, mm-hmm. restaurants, all that sort of thing. Yeah, I like that model a lot better. I mean, that, that's to me, that's new, what that's a city what, is about. That's what New Urbanism was supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, definitely what it was supposed to be. Of course, you get, in this picture, it's a very still very much a car-based uh, city. For sure. Well, parking lots. He gets For into sure. that, too, but he's just pointing out that all of this has the same density as, like, say, a high-rise block. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, but it's not. Cool. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's move on and see what he says parks and public spaces between the buildings, people will spend more time there and socialize more because getting to those places is no longer a hassle. Problem number four is logistics. If you focus a lot of people in a small area, public infrastructure has to keep up somehow. Aside from the need of gigantic parking lots and high capacity public transit, you also need to build out stuff like daycare centers, elementary schools, high schools, retail, public amenities, and you also need to scale this up for tens of thousands of people. And if you have a bunch of office towers, you will end up with an area that is extremely busy during work hours, but otherwise it's completely deserted. And so, for me, these are the four main problems with skyscrapers. They are energy intensive, unaffordable, they alienate you from other people, and they're quite a logistical headache. Now, in the beginning, I've mentioned that I don't think there's any need to build anything taller than 10 stories in 99.9% of cases. And so, let me show you why. This is the Burj Khalifa. It is 828 meters tall and has 163 floors. According to its fact sheet, it has 172,000 square meters of residential space and 28,000 square meters of office space. So these numbers sound pretty impressive, right? That's a lot of residential and office space. And so I present to you this building. It's the so-called Faluhaz or village house in Budapest, the biggest prefab concrete residential block in Hungary from the 70s. The name Village House comes from the fact that this thing houses as many people as an entire village. It has more than 3,000 inhabitants in 884 apartments. It's a 10-story building with a total residential floor space of 43.5 thousand square meters. And so this right here is the plot on which the Burj Khalifa stands. On it we could easily fit five entire village houses. And if we turn four of them into residential blocks and one of them into an office, we get 174 thousand square meters of residential space, 2,000 more, and 43.5 thousand square meters of office space, or 15.5 thousand square meters more. In other words, five (laughs) 10-story tall commie blocks was all it took to beat the world's tallest skyscraper. And he does call it a commie block. And that <laughs> should really tell us something. So to reiterate, skyscrapers can only be used for two things really, office space and residential space, and they're kinda bad at both of those. For residents, skyscrapers are like any other apartment building basically, but with the added disadvantages of living very high above the ground. And the view might be nice, but trust me, it gets old really quickly. And for office workers, skyscrapers are, well, let's just say that COVID-19 has shown us that we don't need so much goddamn office space. Because turns out most of us can work on our computers just as easily from home as we can in the office. And considering how most offices nowadays are the open plan hellscapes, except for your bosses, I think this is a change for the better. You know, I really do think that skyscrapers are just this big, dumb, afterthought kind of solution to the very real problem of lack of housing stock and office space in major urban settlements. 
plans. But then why not start elsewhere? Why not do intelligent, complex urban planning and eliminate instances of wasteful use of public space? Cars, for example, are a huge waste of space. They take up lots of space and they spend 90% of their lifetime parked. So what if, instead of building a skyscraper, we began by reducing the number of cars in the city and built some medium-sized apartment blocks on the now vacant gigantic parking lots? What if we reduced and regulated short-term lease services like Airbnb? Because that alone can occupy a huge part of the housing stock in any major settlement. As you can see, when it comes to handling housing shortages and lack of space in major cities, there's a myriad of other points where we can start that are easier and more effective. Oh, and they also don't cost as much as building a skyscraper. So this would be my case against them. I'm not completely opposed to the idea though, but I think they should be considered only if we have exhausted all the other previous available options. I think that would lead to much better outcomes, both for people and for cities. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe if you haven't already, and if you want to show your appreciation for my content, then there is a Patreon link in the description, so, and I'll be- I want to um, go full snowflake and uh, say a few words on Airbnb. Yeah. The point out that they are racist. It, yes. Uh, let me give you, tell you how. Um, <laughs> it's kind of outright discrimination. It's not like the site is discriminatory. But it really allows people to really show. So maybe it's not Airbnb is racist, but it certainly allows a lot of people to be fucking racist. So my friend, he's on the school board, okay? Really successful guy. Mm -hmm. His uh, parents are from Egypt. So he has an Egyptian name, Emirwani. Mm -hmm. And when so when he books on Airbnb, he books it. And I kid you not, six times in a row, or six different occasions, Two days later, he is told that the place has already been booked by someone else. Yeah. And then suddenly, when his um, his wife, who is, has a Polish name, books, there's there's uh, never any problem. Hmm. This also happened when we were booking uh, for a um, guy's uh, outing in the mountains. Um, half of us did not want to camp. We'll not go into that, but... I wanted to, but, um, so we were picking cabins or houses to stay at. And again, I think again, um, the Egyptian friend books at first and is told then, uh, no, it's actually not available. And this seems to happen. It's not, it's definitely a pattern that's been reported by many. As soon as I say a, a black or p people of color give pictures, they're suddenly denied or Airbnbs that show that it's being rented by a black couple let's say, you'll have people not um, book with them. So, yeah, this whole, like, post-racial yeah. America is quite bullshit um, because people can make whatever lame excuses they want. Um, it's There's some kind of implicit bias happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I can give you an anecdote about that uh, when it comes to Uber and Lyft. I, I uh, did those jobs for about three years, and I was in the online groups, um, like the Facebook groups and stuff like that, and I would hear drivers with uh, foreign-sounding names, um, mm -hmm. and they, they, would, they would complain about how people would cancel as soon as they saw that someone with a foreign-sounding name was coming to pick them up. Um, I've, I've even had passengers, for whatever reason, decide to confess that to me, too. That, that, oh, I'm so glad to, to get a, a white guy, finally. It's like there's only these, and then they used pretty terrible language after that point. Oh, um, full slurs, not just immigrants. Sometimes, sometimes. Because the thing about would... taxi drivers, they're usually, because it is such a, you just have to drive. Mm -hmm. um, it's an entry-level job for right. immigrants. It's why, like, in New York City, immigrants would take be cab drivers. For sure. Um, I mean, my grandfather was a cab driver mm -hmm. uh, for a good amount of time. Uh, now, obviously, he was Jewish, uh, so it wasn't maybe not completely white by the time he was finished doing that. Uh, so I don't know. Like, I can't say more about that. Mm. But yeah, it's why? Why is it? Why? What? What is? What was wrong with having all of these? Well, I well, I guess if they use a slur, of course. Yeah. They're just offended by their existence, yeah, uh, which is just horrible. Right, right, and you know, it 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 seems like these 
these uh, companies that are, uh, you know, the, the gig economy, the, the rent your stuff economy, all that sort of thing. It seems like they're not regulating the stuff too much on their own. Oh, no, no, not at all. So, I mean, but hey, you know, it's it's what the customers want. If the customers are, I mean, white middle class people, then and they're racist or rather just fuck their babies put it that way mm -hmm. it's not just like well we don't have to call people bait you know racist or not so they're just being babies um by baby it just you know self-centered right um biased feel fearful mm -hmm. um brats uh you know how dare people be different yeah really yeah, or, how dare you I don't experience know. diversity I don't, I in don't, the city? I don't get them, or I don't see the humanity in this other person. For sure. Um, so, okay, yeah. so let's move on to the next one. Let's sure. let's see what the, let's see what the so-called comrades uh, uh, of the CCP. Yeah, you want to check how out. how they're they seem to they seem to get uh, get this. Um, so this whole like you know skyscraper is not so good. Um, Seems like a far idea, especially to uh, maybe American audiences, but maybe in, in the uh, echelons of the more uh, enlightened governance uh, in various places, maybe maybe these ideas are not so far out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but let's let's take a look at this. Is a um, this is not a leftist doing this. This is a um, kind of a regular news channel Reuters oh, yeah, which... style. So actually, uh, look down the the B one M. I've BIM. Them. But yeah, uh, I have no idea what one that is, but that that yeah, let, let's dig into it. More mainstream as far as like you know, global news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that for the sake of it. Um, so just quickly to address chat, uh, Scrub Lord, nineteen sixty three. I do support socialism. I I like the idea of democracy in the workplace and more empowerment in people's lives. And uh, that comment right after that, you're saying that people prefer their own kind. Um, since this is the first comment I think you've made on my channel, that that gives me kind of some pause to to um, to where you're coming from, really. So you mean humans, right? Yeah, <laughs> kind is in human. I, yes, I do I, prefer humans. Human usually, kind. do prefer their sure. own, uh, humans, though some humans seem to prefer dogs or cats more. <laughs> I mean, that's um, true as well. I'm partial to llamas, so <laughs> I prefer llamas over humans. Yeah. I guess. So I guess uh, uh, I'm just species that way. But yeah, just 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 a, just a warning, Scrubland. If you're gonna start saying racist stuff, that's gonna get you banned right away. So, yeah, just wanna uh, nip that in the bud before before it gets. Oh, we that. shall taunt you a second time. <laughs> we shall taunt you a second time. All right, let's let's watch the uh, Why China Banned Skyscrapers. Fueled by a booming economy and ever-expanding urban population. China has built more skyscrapers in the last 30 years than the United States did in the entire 20th century. With relaxed planning regulations and near limitless capital, cities across the country have transformed from small regional centers into some of the most densely packed metropolises on our planet. For the construction of some of the world's tallest buildings, a decree by China's central government in April 2020 has brought the country's record-breaking skyscraper boom to an end. They take, On the 27th of April 2020, <laughs> China's Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development issued a notice that introduced measures to, in its own words, further strengthen the management of urban and architectural features. The document, which we've translated from its original Chinese, restricts the blind planning and construction of super-high-rise skyscrapers and states that new buildings over 500 meters in height are not allowed to be built. The notice also heavily restricts the construction of any buildings over 250 meters in height, except where absolutely necessary. And where permission is granted, those towers will be subject to intense reviews by the firefighting, earthquake and energy saving authorities. In addition, local governments are now required to tighten the approval process for towers taller than 100 meters protect natural areas and historic buildings, and appoint chief architects to ensure that any new architecture better represents Chinese culture. Yeah, the not that godless uh, culture, right? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but you'll see for a moment now that like the unregulated, um, more capitalist uh, building boom that has occurred has led to a lot of uh, really uh, shitty things, uh, <laughs> aesthetically speaking. Yeah, yeah. So that, this is them true. kind of saying, okay, we got enough of this uh, bullshit. Uh, we got enough towers. We got enough. Uh, we built enough housing for everybody. Um, we don't need this. Uh, we don't need more. Yeah. Which is, it's good to be able to say no. Well, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely head towards a better direction. It's all copycat architecture, a controversial and head-turning trend, which has seen a number of the world's most famous buildings replicated it's across like, China. It's half recent... Louvre, half uh, castle. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's like trying to be the Louvre with the p glass pyramid in front, but it's not the Louvre. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's Disneyland version Louvre. Or, or the Sim City version, where you can have your global monuments. You can just plop down wherever you feel like in the city. I, I know, and that's like I, that's <laughs> actually the part I don't like about any city building. I don't care about having world landmarks. Yeah, really. I like I and, like some new stuff. Thanks. But but they've done it. They literally. They, it's literally real. They did it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is amazing in one sense. But some of these, some of these boom cities are like Sim City design build uh, cities. Yeah, with the way they're laid out. Well, and some of them are, are basically ghost towns as as well, just because they're mm -hmm. there for land speculation more so than anything else. Exactly. Oh. Oh, yes. Despite no specific reasoning for the changes, the momentum for introducing these rules has kind of been building for some time. Over the last three decades, China has developed at breakneck speed, racing to construct buildings and infrastructure that enable and support its economy, house its vast population, and position it as a new superpower on the world stage. That context gave rise to some challenges, including the construction of the 632-metre Shanghai Tower, a megatall skyscraper that did its job of putting China on the map while claiming the title of the world's second tallest building, but that ultimately required state funding to complete before struggling to lure tenants with its inefficient floor plan. With Boom, projects classic. taller than 300 metres often taking more than five years to complete, the added financial risk that comes with buildings of that scale is also thought to have played a part. Economic tides can easily shift over such long construction periods, leaving developers without a profit. And with most Chinese developers and contractors being at least partly state-owned, the government is often left to take on the financial burden of large schemes. You know, that, that reminds me. I, I used to listen to uh, the Councillor cast. Uh, way back when, mm. before, before he started getting into his shitty politics. But um, uh, <laughs> actually, I'm not quite sure what his politics are like these days. But uh, I thought they neo, were very neoliberal, uh, you know, with a more than a tinge of, of racism and xenophobia uh, splashed. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is unfortunate because he is brilliant when it comes to to uh, city design urban issues. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like he has a lot of good things to say, but he's basically said all that stuff, and now he's just. Railing against uh, SJWs and all that, all that stuff. Now I want to point out here: there's usually probably going to be a challenge from the rhetoric. Uh, just it's very matter of fact presentation here. Uh -huh. But um, just a response from say libertarian friends. Yeah. That well, you know, if it's not a problem if the state doesn't have financial stake in anything, just let the market decide, right? Yeah. Except that when develop private developers also fail and they eat it big time. <clears throat> The public still has to pay absolutely one way or another either through bailouts uh through the financial system you know crashing uh bear markets that are created by this uh bullshit or just the the social ills of all those resources wasted mm -hmm. on these mega projects when they could be going to substantial housing uh or you know, urbanism or just anything, oh, really. Absolutely. So it's just a middle allocation of resources. And this is the Chinese state kind of trying to throttle yeah. the the waste that from the boom times, foreseeing that we're going to be in a long-term bear situation. For sure. Like, okay, we need to cut the fat, but we're not going to cut social programs. We're going to cut the ability to build mm -hmm. bullshit uh, yeah. skyscrapers. 
Yeah, for sure. And uh, uh, my point about what, what Council was was saying is he, he would always question with these these mega structures, like what happens if you have a big downturn in the economy and suddenly, like say your, your residential high rise, you can't keep enough tenants in the building, and the entire thing just folds financially, and you end up getting left with a huge and empty uh, structure. What do you then do mm-hmm. about that? You, you have to, I mean, uh, of course, the government then at some point has to step in and take over. And now they have a huge building that they probably have to dispose of because it probably hasn't been kept up for some time at that point. Well, or, or you, the cost of maintaining it. Or, or just eat is, the cost of is a drain. maintaining it. Yeah. So they're, they're stuck in a, in, a, in a tight spot either way. It, it's kind of like when you have um, in these, these very small uh, rural towns that, that uh, may have a highway going by. And then uh, right at the exit, you have a, um, a, like a gas station that wants to build. And they say, oh, we'll, we'll pay for the road to come out and, and all the utilities to come out from uh, the main drag out to our, uh, our little gas station wow. out, out by the, the, the highway. Uh, and then they'll, they'll give the, that land over to the city. Well, I mean, the, the city says, well, that sounds great for the short term. But then they end up having a huge financial uh, burden with the maintenance later on down the line when you have a way overbuilt road and all these utilities that have been extended way out to where they wouldn't normally go. Yeah, like for a proposed casino yeah, or yeah, something like that, large sure. development or something. Yeah. 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 Like you don't um, – you make – like usually you make an agreement between municipality and developer where it's like, okay, you will build this. You will – it will mm-hmm. be this cost point. Right. Um, for us to put out utilities to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, or like you will pay the taxes no matter what. Yeah. And that it, will be included in your costs uh, in your 10-year budget. That's all well and good. But then when the, the first or, or second um, cycle of maintenance where you get to like 30 years down the road and you have to completely rebuild uh, that street that goes up to it, then it's the, the city that has to, to foot that cost. Um, and you have yeah. other infrastructure like that too. That's yeah. and and the and the land might 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 not be bringing in the property taxes that it did in the first well, ten years. Also, um, well. there's all kinds of things, and and that's kind of how luck, almost luck based, that like so much of the calculations of the calculus of of, of property taxes and mm-hmm. and how prices and markets and all that stuff. It's all so like hoping things will work out um, yeah. or based on unsubstantiated assumptions about where people are moving, how many there will be, what their incomes will be. Will they stay that way for the next 30 years? All things where, yeah, like maybe you can make these assumptions back in 1960. Right. You know, when we had a golden age, uh-huh. but not after 1975. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even just the idea that uh, they're assuming that the the uh, city, whatever municipality, is going to grow economically endlessly. You know, they they base their their future calculations on that sort of thing. That that's a huge gamble as well. You can't necessarily count on that coming through either. You know, all sorts of stuff can happen in the meantime. But anyway, let let's move on with the with the video here. In extreme cases, like the long-delayed 596-meter Golden Finance 117 in Tianjin and the 476-meter Wuhan Greenland Center, projects are placed on indefinite Wuhan! Oh yeah, there's there's your conspiracy theorist link right there. I'm I'm just, anytime it comes up, I'm gonna go, (laughs) Wuhan! I mean, it's a very big city, um, as you can see from this picture here. Yeah, I really knew Um, nothing about it, That's, that's interesting. Anyway, let me carry on. Yeah. Finished edifices looming large over cities. China's cooling view of skyscrapers fits with a broader global trend of concern around extremely tall buildings, which many feel are now relegated to vanity projects for the world's elite, a form of security for foreign investments, or attempts to break new records and actually do very little for cities overall. The new policy tackling skyscrapers and look-alike buildings could also be a response to negative press around the rest of the world, including from our channel. 
As China continues to develop, focus is shifting onto placemaking, with large master-planned districts seeking to create more economical, green and beautiful cities that emphasize people and practicality. Now I want to point out that these these master plan, you know, super blocks. Yeah. Still very top down. Yes. Not could be not considered democratic. And bottom socialists like us don't actually like uh, I don't like them. I, um, I don't much either. Whether they're usually like, you know, either a big state project or a corporation, which is usually the case of corporate sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Um it's not uh bottom up planned yeah which is that you know things could go block by block by communities right. for sure but that's that's the ideal i would agree with that too and and those those mega plans can suffer from all that same financial uh risk that they were talking about with the, yeah, the skyscrapers ex as well. exactly a small is beautiful approach right it's is where we're kind of really coming from and skyscrapers of course represent the biggest of the big yeah for sure Definitely. So just shifting to more horizontal mega projects, uh, of course, isn't isn't a placia, but it, it is a little better. A little better. I would agree with that. Since the first skyscrapers rose in the 1880s, building tall has been the way that a country announces its arrival on the world stage. As we saw in the US and Middle Eastern markets, this often starts with an intense period of speculative and rapid development before regulations, economics and new realities direct projects down more modest paths. While it will be some time before we understand how strict authorities will be with enforcing these regulations, the reduction of the Shuzhou Hungam Centre from 729 to 499 metres could be a sign that the height of China's skyscraper boom is now behind us. Ready. If you enjoyed this video and would Makes like for to a get good more from the definitive the video channel for construction, <laughs> subscribe to the B1M. The B1M. The B1M. I've the B1M. never heard you. <laughs> Sounds a lot like the BBC, but yeah, interesting. I suppose. Um, Oh, maybe. Hmm. Well, I, had, I could look into it, but um, yeah, I mean, I when I see the logo, I think BIM, which is um, architectural software. Uh huh. Okay. So. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. I never got into the, the software side of architecture too much. Neither did I, and that's why I'm uh, not that employable. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I feel the same way with, instead. Uh, I feel the same way with uh, GIS. I had I had the the. The mm -hmm. opportunity to, to learn ArcGIS and um, other other courses got in the way, so I just never did it. And that tends mm -hmm. to be the number one thing that a lot of cities look for, um, for plans. Yeah, I got enthused with more how to design than what to design with. Right, yeah. Well, and me too. Huh. You know, I've, I've always... Because, yeah. I've always cared more about the, the, the patterns of how cities move and... and uh, techniques to, to build community and and connectedness uh, more so than than yeah techno wizardry and and uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing so the next video um, and it can be up to you as well if you want to do a different one from hunker you know but I... this is part three which is a really good one I mean it's like it's kind of even me with everything I know kind of blows your mind a bit <laughs> the, the infinity pools one i assume you're talking about yeah yeah because <laughs> the next one is called civic thick um number part four and that one kind of explains you know the brutalism of the 50s and 60s okay and ugly civic buildings um nice. but the the fourth video i gave you was actually defensive brutalism which i kind of i don't know if i've actually watched it so we can actually react to it together fresh um you know, I I kind of like to to do the the stupid city one if if you don't mind, because uh, oh. this will oh, yeah. this will probably be the last one I have time for tonight. I really got a a hard stopping point at, at ten because I I have my job tomorrow at five in the morning, so that's about as very as, well. as I can go. So I think it'd be nice to end on a on a more fun note with the the hunker three D mm -hmm. thing, if you don't mind. Oh, it's it's fun, but also very depressing. Well, I mean, I I can take that mix. But, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, what's the uh, that's the word 
that's used to say describe a venture time where it's both like oh. happy and sad. I guess bittersweet is, is the first word that comes to mind, but yeah, well, um, yeah, kind carry of, on. Maybe maybe wistful. I don't know. Anyway, let, yeah, let's move on. Let's. In the context of of Bezos. Space flight. Yeah, yeah. How much more do you need? And, and yeah, that how baffles much, that baffles me. That what, these... how much does musk need right but but you, they say it very blatantly they've said it for for decades you know the decade that they've been uh 100 billionaires that they want to con- like they see themselves as the controllers of the future yeah our future yeah the great the great and there's history. there are a lot of people that are happy about that oh yeah they have so many that's what really frightens me that there isn't even this resistance to that that these Few men control, quote, our future. That yeah. makes me very mad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, how, well. and how dare they? Me as well. Uh, yeah. That, that's definitely the, the reactionary. He's going to start talking soon. Part of people's mind. Okay. Welcome to... <clears throat> <clears throat> Welcome to episode three of Stupid City. Episode one was about the privatized green space of public gardens, and episode two was about how the air rights market in New York is leading to very tall and skinny luxury condo towers. So so episode three is going to be a conclusion of what we could call the land, air, and sea arc because we're going to talk about infinity pools. Kind of. The Infinity Pool is the latest attraction of hotels, resorts, and high-end residences around the world. It's like a normal swimming pool, except one of its edges vanishes. At certain angles, it disappears, making it look like... That one, there's that one in, uh, I think that's the one in, is it Kuala Lumpur? It's it's that Um, one where they have a park, just like, set on top of three different... I guess so, yeah, I see that. I guess that's the Twin Towers in the background there. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's what it looks like. The Patronus Towers. Yeah, yeah. Quite quite the feat of engineering, but man. <laughs> You'll get into what the problem is. Yeah, I'm sure. Look like you're wading through the entire expanse of the horizon rather than a very small, very engineered box of climate-controlled water. As you can see, it's a very trendy social media trope and a status symbol. I mean, it looks cool. It's a real accomplishment of engineering. It makes use of a catch basin at the outer edge for water to be constantly pumped back in. But I'm not going to linger on the technical details. I want to talk about infinity pools in a little more abstract way. And that means talking about one of the world's first infinity pools, which isn't really an infinity pool. It's not really a pool at all. It's more of a ditch. Ditch. It's the Waiahole Ditch. Because I got my education in the United States, I was taught that before they were discovered in the late 1700s, the Hawaiians toiled under an oppressive feudal system worse than anything found in medieval Europe, and that they were just itching to be liberated by enlightened American colonizers. It turns out this was completely false. The people of Hawaii, the Kanaka Maoli, had a pretty complex system of districting for trade between the fishing villages of the beach and the farming folks inland. There was no money because there were no economic classes, everybody was just kind of provided for, and nobody owned the land. Or everybody owned the land. There's a Hawaiian word, ea, which sort of means sovereignty and stewardship at the same time. The water is the ea of the fish, oxygen is the ea of humans, and the people were the ea of the land. They tended to it, used it for sustenance, and so on. The Hawaiians had an early version of what you could maybe call communalism, or maybe even another word that sounds like communalism. Resources were shared between farmers who raised crops like kalo and coastal communities who caught fish, and big decisions were overseen by clergy and land managers who were made up of folks from families in each district. But nobody had more right or access to land or water than anybody else. And then colonialism happened. And in 1848, after decades of economic and social pressure from the American pioneers, 
King Kamehameha III put into law the Great Mahele, the Great Portioning. This divided the land of Hawaii evenly among the state, the clergy, and the people. The Great Mahele and the Kuleana Act two years later were meant to preserve native ownership of the land, but by now a very small percentage is still owned by the Kanaka Maoli because Americans ended up using these laws to whittle away public ownership, with hundreds of thousands of acres being transferred to the U.S. government and consolidated under corporations. There were many decades of very brutal stuff, including the erasure of Hawaiian culture and language by Christian missionaries, genocide by disease and poverty, violent overthrow of the monarchy by the United States at the behest of businesses, illegal annexation, and sugar. Oh, sugar. Yeah. As with most colonies in the Pacific and Caribbean, sugar plantations played a huge role in the exploitation of Hawaiian resources. It's an immensely profitable industry, and they had immensely cheap labor in the form of natives and heaps of immigrants from Europe and Asia. It's also a very resource-intensive crop because sugar is thirsty. The Waiahole Ditch was built in the early 1900s by a group of rich white entrepreneurs calling themselves the Oahu Sugar Company. It directed groundwater from streams on the windward side of Oahu, where communities had been farming their staple diet for centuries, to the leeward side of Oahu for sugar to be exported and traded as a commodity on the global market. This starved thousands of people and drove them into poverty, away from the farm and into urban life. A lot of them ended up working for their sugar plantations. The Waiahole Ditch continued to divert water to plantations on the Awa Plains until a series of legal battles in the 90s restored half of the diverted water flow to its original streams and set a precedent for water protection on the islands. But the damage was done, and it's a pretty standard case of the way colonizers used to break down their subjects through privatization and marketization of public goods. I say used to because most of this work is now done by the IMF. Every hundred acres of sugar requires about a million gallons of water per day to grow. Per day? The Oahu Sugar Company, which was a subsidiary of AMFAC, hard used to the Waiahole Ditch to conceptualize that. It is hard to, to wrap your mind around that much water needs. And, uh... As I understand it, it, sugar doesn't even do that well in Hawaii. Like there's a lot more, there's many more crops that, that do a whole lot better. So it was just, yeah, it was just thought like, oh, it's tropical. Yeah, exactly. And sugar grows in tropical, just like Cuba. Uh -huh. So obviously it should go there. Um, yeah. Because we could annex Hawaii. Uh -huh. But we, we, America, have not been able to, as of yet, uh, annex Cuba. Yeah, uh, but as my um, comrade from the SP has uh, titled an essay he just wrote, uh, Cuba is resilient, the U.S. is relentless. That's wow. That's, that's or as resilient as the U.S. is relentless. As the U.S. Is, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, hopefully so. <laughs> I hope that. I hope they never fall to the U.S. Um, wow. Yeah divert about 30 million gallons a day from east to west Oahu. The Kohala Ditch, built by Castle and Cook, diverts 27 million gallons of water a day from the lush Pololu Valley to North Kohala on the Big Island. The Alexander and Baldwin Company's ditch on Maui was built in the late 1800s and as of this recording in mid-April 2019, is still leaching 80 million gallons of water a day from East Maui to feed a 40,000 acre plot in Central Maui. And they don't even make sugar anymore. These are three of the big five sugar barons. How is this, I mean, how is this even legal anymore? How, how are there no water rights that, that come into play, diverting entire watersheds from one side of an island to another for private business? Like, Well, I, um, it's not only legal. Uh, here in New York, in some cases, it's actually subsidized. Oh. Um, in the case of, I mean, it isn't um, a million gallons a day, but um, there was a, the state pretty much paid to build a, a pipe, a water pipe, mm -hmm. for the chip fab plant in Malta. Uh, this is part of like a tech valley boom where, you know, through a lot of government subsidy as well as long-term planning to kind of bring a lot of 
Silicon Valley type industry to the huts uh, to the capital district. Wow. Uh, to kind of replace the loss of um, every other type of industry that we've ever had. Yeah. Um, it used to be, it was railroads, there was all kinds of uh, different factories and farming. And basically since the 70s, it's all leached out, been moved elsewhere, um, and, or been out-competed uh, on the market. But that has left us with uh, virtually no jobs except um, education, health care, and government. Um, or insurance, but I guess that falls under health care. Jeez, I mean, that, that's the trend of the entire country. Yeah, those, those but they have, yeah but, but like um, in the early 90s or late 80s, it was kind of like there were these visionary kind of economic guys who were like, okay, the industry of the future, let's make sure that we have the institutions to make sure that we have a part in the new industries of the future, which would be nanotech and uh, chip fab and, and Silicon mm -hmm. Valley type stuff. Mm -hmm. And it has been sort of successful, but also at the same time, not that successful. Um, because uh, heavy government subsidy every step of the way, it's every company has had to be bribed to come here. Basically, you know, taxes yeah. or minimal taxes. I mean, IBM has their research plan or whatever. I know there's this nanotech center that's very large and uh, it's very shiny looking, um, but it's also completely disconnected from the urban fabric. Uh, Basically, it's uh -huh. a commerce park. And yeah. So yeah, I'll stop there. But yeah, but as far as like the the dit, um, ditches leak leaching water, you know, because yeah. it is just a ditch, right? It's uh -huh. not like an actual pipe. Um, that's why it's like it's diverting water, oh, and okay. it's never been closed to keep the water on that side, um, because what the ditch does is uh, I guess it collects rain rainwater runoff at one elevation. And then so it's moving it to the other side and it's not going to the yeah. lower elevations of that side of the island. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, I guess because it's still private land, no one can fill it or it's allowed to that must um, be, fill but... the dishes. But I guess maybe it, you need capital and, and equipment to fill them. Yeah. I, I don't, don't know. know. I, I don't know the inside story. He He gives his sources on all this. Yeah. So. Well, I, guess I we think just... deeper reading would be required. For sure. Yeah, I guess we'll just move along for now. To still own huge portions of formerly communal land in Hawaii, they have offices all over the islands and even some on the mainland with publicly listed addresses. Sugar came to dominate the Pacific wink, and wink. Caribbean economies. <laughs> and in the meantime, the United States converted Hawaii essentially into a remote military outpost massively inflated real estate prices with huge subsidies for military personnel and used seized land to build bases all over. They even reserved an entire island exclusively for testing bombs and nukes. In 1959, the people of Hawaii were granted a choice to become a state or remain a colony. They'd seen what remaining a colony meant, so they decided to try statehood out. Although not really because at this point Hawaii's voting bloc was infested with white people and a lot of the remaining Kanaka Maoli stayed home. The birth of the suburb and the jet engine led to an influx of upper middle class Westerners who were susceptible to democracy, the tropical paradises right? promised by advertising, <laughs> right. leading to Magic the dominance of, of the tourism industry throughout the post-colonial world. Cultures which colonizers spent centuries violently erasing are now exhumed and put on display to sell vacation packages and timeshares and spa getaways and destination weddings, and honeymoons, and baby moons, which is a honeymoon you take when you're pregnant, and anniversaries, and friend anniversaries, and Mai Tais, and tote bags, and sun hats, and infinity pools. Pause. So, like, I, it, it's kind of, it, it sends a chill up my spine. I, maybe not chill, but uh, uh, kind of a, a, a spun of anger. To see, like, the so t talking from like the complete abuse of land and people, mm -hmm. and how, like, okay, the sugar didn't again, as you said, it didn't do actually well. So, all of this 
land seizing and the moving of water was actually a big waste of time right. and a big flop. And But none of it was set right because obviously that would be, you'd have to spend money to fix your mistake. No way. <laughs> and... And then, and then, and then it goes into the military thing, but also post-war travel, and the, you know, the tourism packages, which of course is a through line to today. It has not changed in iota, the cycle of exploitation, or, or that the exploitation of an island goes from raw resources to tourism, mm -hmm. which kind of plays out in playing Tropico to a bit, yeah, to that, some extent. That's for sure. Um. Though you're not forced to develop tourism on whatever game you play, but um, I mean scenarios. It's, there's a story to it mm -hmm. uh, um, where you you're developing industry, and then it's actually more economically efficient to have tourism mm -hmm. or to have a mix of both. Right. Yeah, I, I remember playing that game, and and at the time I I didn't know much about uh, uh, communism at all, so I I would always choose tourism. And yeah, <laughs> a, a cup, a, a few of my citizens did well after that point, but for the most part, oh really? Not really. Well, I <laughs> what was interesting is, well, you can pick all like the socialist policy, uh -huh. but like the because because I mean it's honest in that like you're you the player are the dictator right. that's putting down all the buildings, right? right. Just as. I mean, in SimCity, you put down the zones and, you know, quote unquote, capitalist forces, then fill in the zones. Right. In Tropico, like other types of games, city building, where you're just plopping buildings down, um, again, you're plopping everything down, all the housing, all the hotels. Mm -hmm. So they're technically all state hotels. Sure. Or, or whatever. That's true. And, and there's maintenance that you, the state or the government, is paying. So any money that's made through any businesses is going right into the state coffers, which then you can choose to spend on uh, a social democratic kind of economy where you are you can set the policies so that you're providing basically housing, food, and other things for low to no cost. Mm -hmm. Right. I you know, you can choose to have a completely like library socialism. Yeah. And I like the ability to do that. Without like capitalism being, or any kind of market forces being gone, or, but again, it's a like kind of there's a steady stream of tourists or trade. You know, there's no, um, although sometimes the scenarios will throw like oh depression or, it usually doesn't affect you per se. Right. Yeah, I remember that. So what you doing there? I uh, I was just gonna put the the link to the video in for for people if they wanted to to see it for themselves. Oop, I know I'm going back to the wrong one. Okay. Yeah, I just thought I'd share the link to the, to the video in case people were curious about seeing it themselves. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So now we have returned back to infinity pools. Yeah, infinity pools. Carrying on. Come on now. Like the Waihole Ditch and all other irrigation systems used to siphon life from native farms to massive plantations, the infinity pool is a diversion of both land and water. It loses about 15,000 gallons of water a day from evaporation and requires constant energy for heating and hydraulics. Whoa, I had no idea it had that kind of loss. That's incredible. I, I'm I don't sorry. know if he's talking about, I think he's talking about all affinity pools on Hawaii. Oh, okay. Um, that would make a lot of sense. 15,000 a day. Um, but still. I don't know where you get that kind of stat, but I may be. I guess you just take the calculation of the. Yeah, gallons of it and and average loss. Mm -hmm. Multiply it out, maybe. But pools, pools are mostly yes. They they lose a lot of water from evaporation. Yeah. Um. So I don't really like pools. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm a lake guy. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Or we should have, you know have have public lakes. Yeah, just uh, convert your pool into a, an aquaponics. Yeah, sort of and as far as instead. as far as urban areas, like you clear. Uh, what is it called? You daylight your buried streams. Yes. Then you can basically landscape a stream that obviously most streams go through parks. Mm -hmm. And you basically can create a big pond. Yeah. And, and obviously can service like half a million people, but can service a neighborhood. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely prefer that sort of thing myself too. Same scale as a splash pad or 
For sure. Uh, community pool. Yeah. All right. It's designed to be wasteful. The infinity pool is a tiny rigid container used to harness a formerly bountiful resource, imposing artificial scarcity while providing the illusion of abundance. And today, I'm proud to unveil the latest in Infinity Pool technology, Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg, this, this dude looks hilarious. Mark Zuckerberg became the world's, I don't know, third richest man by selling ads on Facebook. In 2016, he spent Christmas at his $100 million property on the Hawaiian island Kauai. He made a Facebook post where he gushed about how his family fell in love with the community of Kauai, celebrating the natural beauty and wildlife. A few days later, he filed hundreds of lawsuits against his new neighbors. <sighs> Remember the Kuleana Act from 1850, where the land was portioned out to be passed down from the native bloodline? It turns out that some of the land within the boundaries of Zuckerberg's 700-acre estate was still owned by the land's descendants. So Zuckerberg teamed up with a retired professor whose ancestral claim to the land gave him leverage in a quest to scoop up the remaining Kuleana titles in a process not unlike the way developers in Manhattan compile air rights to build their ultra-thin skyscrapers, except these land rights were largely passed down through birthright without documentation. Some of the owners don't even have last names. So Zuckerberg got tired of trying to individually buy everyone out and uh, sued them. One of the litigating attorneys argued it is not reasonable or practical for 138 parties to own and control 2.35 acres. But these are generations of people who, despite only officially quote-unquote owning small percentages, grew up with access to this land, access to the beach nearby. But that's like saying it. that it's impractical for a town to own a park. Right. Because the town is representative of 500 families. Right, for sure. And there's a two-acre park. Yeah, 500 families. It owns it. Uh-huh. Now, similarly, this uh, shared ownership mm -hmm. has a similar function that because it's, it's referring to a beach. Right. Fucking beach. <laughs> that Zuckerberg doesn't want anyone else on. Of course, he doesn't want anyone else on. And yeah, it's just yeah, it's a it's monstrous. And this was covered quite widely uh, uh -huh. when he was doing the lawsuits. But this is just kind of some of the background yeah. and how it fits into the big picture. Yeah. Well, I of, the, these, of everything. These hereditary schemes of of, of ownership. Uh, were, were set up pretty intentionally to, to have that effect by uh, the white colonialists because they, they knew that just generation after generation, you're going to have yeah. smaller and People smaller die fragmentation. Out. And then, yeah, oh, you know, lost the, the record of who owned well, this. It's funny how planet. whites are, are, you know, white nationalists are uh -huh. so paranoid about being outbred yeah. or, you know, being destroyed as a race. Uh -huh. They do it all the time. Oh, absolutely. They yeah. do it to everyone else. Bye -bye. That's what. So that's all they're really afraid of. Yeah, they're afraid they... of having the another and a long line of people who just didn't have uh, or assimilated or melded in or were killed off. Which, of course, isn't really going to be the case anytime uh, anymore. You know, people are not completely. You know, well, there's ethnic cleansing, mm -hmm. but how do you ethnic cleanse whiteness exactly? Because and this, is, this really is the like thing about so, race yeah. relations. And kind of why I like if, if 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 I was ever like in a I think there was a I'll, I'll watch this other debate thing about like should we recognize transracialists or something. Yeah. And the thing is like I'm kind of ambivalent about that because well I don't want to recognize whiteness as something real. Right. So and if and since race is a social construct as much as like uh, as anything else. Yeah. That. It doesn't shouldn't matter as far as the law or, or anything else is concerned, material conditions, then I why should I care? It, unless you're coming at um, race relations or rather, for fuck fuck's sake, class or whatever of uh, um, these issues as a matter of like special treatment, mm -hmm. in which case you are using the same narrative as the right wingers. Yeah, I, I can understand that. That sort like of idea. you can't recognize someone becoming black mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. then they'd be taking what exactly? 
I mean, it's insulting for sure, but that isn't the same as oppression or feeding into it. I mean, I'm just coming at this from a post I just saw about um, turfs. Um, because the Greens have uh, kind of officially kind of laid down the law and kicked out this group of turfs that uh, kind of took over the Georgia Green Party. Oh, really? And after a year-long process, they um, it was voted at our annual meeting last week uh, to de de recognize them, okay. de associate. Well, that sounds um, like progress, sure. To the chagrin of, of course, all those other kind of turfs, including. Uh, a local candidate of ours who, once he uh, lost his school board race, he got in third. It was a good showing. But uh, he just suddenly like went full like anti-identity politics mm. and these trans ideology people are ruining the left, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Uh, really, really reactionary shit. And it's sad because he's a nice enough guy. Can talk about class politics sort of good. Uh-huh. But then kind of um, but um, Antonio from from uh, South Carolina's Green Party branch, real black par- panther party guy kind of guy. And um, he kind of put it like this that um, let's see, did I save it? No, because we're not going to do architecture shaming. So give me a second. Sure. I know I'm going real off the road here, but <laughs> we can take a I think this, detour. Sure, I think this is super cool, interesting. So, so turfs kind of talk of sex-based rights. Um, yeah. That and, and this is this is the his first line. The oppressed need the oppressed need solidarity and power, not protection, because the turf argument is that trans rights arose protection for women. Yeah, or the sexual I know they say that, yes. So here's his, this is what he wrote in response. This is good. The concept of sex-based rights, such as those espoused in the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, is inherently right-wing. Evidently, the vast majority of women seem to agree, given the fact that it is several years old and still has less than 20,000 international sets, uh, signatures. How is this concept of sex-based rights right-wing or reactionary? This manipulative obfuscation is what is basically anti-trans fear-mongering upholds the concept that equal rights protections uphold special rights for women that are being eroded. Mm -hmm. Would someone call affirmative action and the Civil Rights Act race-based rights? That would totally play into the agenda of racists, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, the racists do call it that, for sure. They do. This rhetoric also helps, and it doesn't, and liberals play into it, every day um and this is where it's funny that like you know the the socialists that or the lefties that are turfs will call well the, he, he actually lays it out here when serious radicals stand up to defend trans people from this warped version of feminism we are summarily labeled as id poll liberals cancel cultural fascists and social justice warriors mm-hmm. just like people who defend the blm movement are labeled the same way this is the classic right-wing propaganda to lump people fighting for liberation in with the most opportunistic and undisciplined elements of the struggle, mm-hmm. referring to, you know, the liberals among us. Uh, this serves as a convenient distraction from their own bigotry and opportunism. Just as only a tiny percentage of white supremacists openly say that they don't like black people, even many KKK members say they simply want segregation of the races to, quote, protect the survival of the white race. Mm-hmm. They're race-based rights, if you will. Mm-hmm. Huh. He wrote more, but I'll stop there. Yeah, well... Um, we have, uh, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's wrap this up so we can go to bed. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I just I got just a few minutes here left. But, but yeah, that, that's... Uh, yeah, I'll have to think a lot more about that, that speech and that idea. It is they're a lot to think about, but I've been like, and... engrossed in it for a month now. Yeah, I'll look into that as well. Have all intentions of keeping it in their lives, but none of the funds to do so now that it's been challenged. And along with these lawsuits, he built a mile-long six-foot wall on his stretch of Kulau Road and hired guards to intimidate people who crossed the property line, even inadvertently. He withdrew from the lawsuit after public outcry, but the retired professor carried it through and the land was brought to auction. 
Just a few weeks ago in March 2019, the professor successfully bid over a million dollars for three of the remaining parcels, about two acres of land. He declined to say whether he had the financial backing of Zuckerberg. An opposing group of descendants won the bid for the fourth parcel, about 5,000 square feet for $700,000. Hmm. There's this thing architects like to talk about called a datum. It's like a line or a plane that a structure is organized around. The datum of a house is the ground. The datum of these buildings is Michigan Avenue. The Villa Savoy got famous for disestablishing the datum. It kind of looks like it's floating, like the house is detached from the ground. And some people call this an infinite datum. The infinity pool has the datum of the resort it's attached to, but it works to create a second datum, the horizon. Hmm. So even though it's a very small tub of water, it implies an infinite connection to the water beyond it. Hmm. It's a deliberate ambiguity. Are you swimming in a resort pool or the ocean? Is it there naturally or was it brought there by irrigation? Is it fresh water or is it salty? Or is it sweet, like the syrup boiled over at the old plantation? Or is it the crystal clear urine of a dawdling tourist, bottled up and sold back to him at a premium? We may never know, but regardless of what Zuckerberg plans to do with his land on Kauai, he's already created an infinity pool in a way. He has massively inflated property value of land that up until even the time of this recording was communally owned and used, and he essentially privatized a pristine stretch of public beach, restricting access to water. He even called his shell company North Shore Kahlo LLC in a nod to the farming communities devastated by sugar irrigation. In keeping with the trend of wow. tourism replacing sugar as the primary export of colonized nations, it's fitting that the newest land dispute is created by the guy who owns Instagram. But in case this is being read in court, I just want everyone to know that I'm obviously joking about all this, and I can't wait to see what sustainable development Mr. Zuckerberg brings to Kauai. And I love him, and I want him to play can, with can my Can you stay for a moment? Stop for a moment. Sure. I, I just... I think it's... There's, there's all these going... Like, the, the, the cyclical or the, the spiral motion of, of the dialogue here, mm -hmm. of going between the... The history, the present, the concepts of the infinity pool, the abstract version of it, right. relating it to the process of privatization and, and the tourism with like showing all those Instagram posts, which are just kind of to, to some aesthetic level gross. Yeah. Um, with its wastefulness, its ostentatiousness, you know, whatever. We, we just hate fun. No. I like camping. I like being in nature. Mm -hmm. It's not about the view. I'm not disputing how nice the view is. Right. It's how the view is achieved and what the people are doing. But anyway, the fact that he brings it around to the guy who's now doing the prioritization mm -hmm. owns the ability for the tourist to Instagram. Yeah. And that's just another like, yeah. you know, it's all connected, man. I'm all connected. There's your real conspiracy theory. And that's what's interesting about, like, I mean, why I really pit, uh, find conspiracy theories um, or QAnon are pitiful. Um, because all you have to do is have some knowledge or, like, you know, a video like this explaining, like, the history that's real and how everything's connected. Right. And it doesn't have to be crazy. No. If it can make total sense. And you can actually explain it to people and it'll still make total sense to them. You can, mm -hmm. you might actually be able to build solidarity and an actual movement to do something against the powers that be. Yeah. And instead of just frittering about, um, about how uh, terrible it all is, now we need to resist by doing what exactly? Storming the Capitol in a rage? Yeah. Uh, picketing some uh, the Oscars or something? Yeah, having a Twitter war. With yeah, or, or, or what it really comes down to, posting and owning libs. Owning the libs, that's right. That's what it always comes back to. But yeah, you're right. Uh, those those QAnoners. I, I, whatever the opposite of Occam's razor, that, that seems to be their, their guiding light. It's like, it's just too simple, man. It's, it's got to have more layers. And so they yeah. pick and choose from the buffet of... of other conspiracy theories since 
you know, go back as far as I mean, as let's see. I, I can't recall the last time I had some kind of cons- um, conversation with such a personality mm-hmm. where I say, like, what is... Because maybe I, that is my go-to question. Like, what is insufficient about the explanatory value of, mm, let's say, class-based analysis or yeah. a um, the news items put in a row? You know, yeah. you will you see a satanic cabal but that's kind of where like the certain videos like with channel five mm-hmm. slash no all, all gas no breaks um is showing that like the the mindset behind a lot of the conspiracy theorists are that they are hyper religious they oh, are yeah, that's true um seeing things in black and white nuanced or historical analyses just don't make sense to them right so it doesn't explain anything because as far as they're concerned, the Bible explains everything. Yeah. And so they're fitting current events into like, they're trying to fit that what goes on today and make, make sense in the context of uh, the book of revelation, uh, revelations. Right. Yeah. I, I think also, that's what we observe for sure. Yeah. And I, I think they, they want to believe that that every bad thing that's happened in their life, every every failure, uh, isn't due to their their own failings or, or or misfortune, or you know, even more so, the a system that is, is stacked against them, uh, in, in the way that capitalism is. But but it has to be some, you know, shadowy force that uh, plays behind the scenes and and just pulls all the strings that they can themselves join together and fight. Like they, they just can't imagine not having agency in their own lives, even, even though they clearly don't. No, well, though, so they, the, this is where the white supremacy kind of comes in, mm-hmm. where their ideal is that everything is laissez-faire and that's what's corrupted. Because mm-hmm. if things were laissez-faire and people were able to succeed and fail based on their own merit, right. obviously them as the superior people would succeed right and so when they don't succeed they it has to be pure idea. evil yep yep in the religious sense and in the christian sense it has right. to be pure evil because if i mean if, obviously if there was an evil sabotaging them they would be the greatest right because they're the best yeah now if you ask them why do you think you're the best well that's where you get into implicit bias of uh phrase yeah. or, or something else. or it's just like i'm responsible i was raised right uh-huh. And then maybe it's not so much white supremacy, but Christian supremacy or Western evangelical Shalvinism, supremacy. Like, you know, all that, all yeah. that stuff. Pretty interconnected. Uh, yeah, it mixes together. Yeah. So then he ends by mentioning um, yeah. Musk. Yeah, let's let's uh, get that last cut, that last minute. I also want to note that right. all the electricity on Kauai is owned by Elon Musk. <laughs> so... And there so it is. let me know what your is. city has done to consolidate public land into private hands, or what your colonial settler state has done to make reparations for its crimes, or if you just think free public utilities are cool. And speaking of free public utility, check out these books at your local library. As always, thank you to the people on Patreon. The more of my income that comes from your support, the more time and resources I can spend researching and editing these videos. Unfortunately, wow. he stopped making videos roughly, I guess, maybe it was during the pandemic. Yeah. So maybe his patrons pulled out or... That's too bad. Something like I that. I like his style and I like the way he presents things. Yeah. I mean, they are very well researched. Yeah. Um, his last one was a little less researched. Um, I don't know what it is. It is. It's, it's about... Um, um, Soviet model cities that they Soviet built like in Siberia awesome. and stuff. <laughs> well, that definitely sounds interesting, but yeah, huh. the Suicide Hill one is about um, downtowns creating like party districts. Oh, in their in their downtowns, to as a way of offsetting all of the terrible planning um, of letting their downtowns basically rot out. Uh huh. By not actually using, uh, say, rivers and tearing up the mass transit that used to exist. Because mm-hmm. it's about Kansas City, particularly. Kansas City, okay. 
Mm -hmm. It's where he grew up, apparently. Okay. Yeah, he always pulls out really interesting, kind of off-the-beaten-path topics. But, yeah, mm -hmm. that's really cool. Well, all right. I think we're going to have to wrap it up for tonight. Um, yeah, the one, word, one full edition of two leftists talk planning and city yeah. issues. Yeah. Talk urbanism. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to keep this this series of uh, new urbanist stuff going because I always I have, I have so much to think about uh, after each time we get together. Um, so I'll pull up your... Really makes you think, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I, I wish I had more to say about it, but in the moment I'm just processing so much because so much of this is, is, is new to me. I know, it's blind. I, I mean, I, I consider it mind-blowing, so yeah. you're, you're, I'm granting you, granting you that. Now, you've seen you brought up Pod News. This is one of the many apps I, I don't have to personally put my show up on, uh, but because I... it's on a, a feed uh, through Apple, it goes to all these other places, which yeah. is good. Yeah, it's, so it's really um, cool. this week's episode, uh, which I uploaded, is Friday, is a clip show of... Not that one. That's the last post. So I guess I need right. to make a post. But it's, uh, what are the Greens doing these days? And it's uh, basically content from our national meeting. That was last week, uh, which is mostly just a bunch of talks slash workshops and over Zoom. And so I just took kind of half an hour from four of them. There were an, at least another four that I would recommend kind of checking out if you have the time or if you're listening to why you play games like I do. But I listened to like six hours worth and brought it down to two. Cool. The one before that is where I have a friend from downstate where we kind of became friends through the new atheist movement. And then we cover some food stories. Mostly awesome. kind of hash out because he is not food a full socialist, socialist but. Hmm? A food socialist. So. No, no, no. I said he's not a full socialist. I'm just socialist. reading the title. The new atheist oh, okay. and food socialist banter. Banter, yeah. Well, I mean, because it's like food, but well, well I'm, I'm playing off of that, like new atheist, food socialist. Uh, otherwise, I could call it old old socialist banter, I guess. But <laughs> okay. um, I just wanted to put like food as an adjective okay. for socialist, like new is an adjective for atheist. Sure. Uh, weird yeah, sense okay. of humor, probably very dry. <laughs> but um, he. He kind of sees like his main priority is competence. Mm -hmm. So whatever kind of leads to more competence in government or society is what he is for. Okay. And so like of course the com uh, the case can be made that co-ops are more competent than other businesses. Shared ownership makes things more competent than concentrated ownership. Mm -hmm. Um. But uh, he was kind of uh, he sent me an email with his kind of more clarifications of thoughts that he had but couldn't express at the time okay because he was kind of asking questions about like because we're reading about like uh, a town that started a grocery store but there it's a red state it's florida people mm -hmm. um but they just had no market um no private entity was going to build a grocery store or run one so they had to run one themselves but it's usually towns that have a mayor who has run something mm -hmm. or managed a store. So it's like, uh, fine. I guess we'll do it. Yeah. But then, then they can't call it socialist because of the prevailing. Well, they don't because, um, well, it's just the gut, you know, it's just the town doing it. Yeah. yeah. It's, not it's, socialist. Just, it's just us all pooling our resources to, to help each other out and provide a necessary service for life. It's not socialism. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. Well, I mean, well, you know, it's like the, um, the Richard Wolf quip, you know, quip. Uh, socialism is when the government does stuff. Oh, yeah. The more it does, the more socialist it is. And if it does a lot of stuff, it's communism. It's communism. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, of course, they're they're providing a, a needed service, which is providing yeah. food for people. So. But at the same time, like co-ops are more democratic, but still in a market, still kind of capitalist as far as the mech the social relations yeah they definitely uh, can so be closer to there's a lot things. more to think about and obviously the conquest of bread lays out a little bit of a sketch and there's kind of updated versions of conquest of bread for sure for sure also i see 
Oh, you have episode 122. Oh, I guess I need to change that. Okay. Um, No, 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 no. One is the episode that links to the iTunes feed, and the other is a post. Oh, I see. So it's a post. So you can more easily read. I see. So you can more easily read the sources, I assume. I see. Although I think it's in the other podcast, too. So maybe I don't need to do a post. I kind of stopped doing that. Yeah. Actually, can you go back into the other page? Sure thing. And click the other 122? Uh, the one with the... The one up here? Yeah, I guess. The, yeah. July 24th one. So that one has... Yeah, this is the post version of it. Okay. And yeah, because it doesn't, I didn't put in the file, I guess. Cool. That's strange. Yeah. I guess I'll have to test pages when I make them. Sure. I mean, so I know what I'm doing. It's not, it's not like it makes things. I just want to make sure that people can read the sources because, like, say in iTunes, I don't know if people can actually read what I put in. Oh, that's true. Like, is it visible? Because I think I tried that and, um, I couldn't read the sources. Huh. Okay. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to check. Yeah. Anyway. Do you know the meme, are not... we winning, son? Are we winning, America? Yeah. Are, are you winning, son? You oh, don't know the meme, yes. Do I do vaguely remember that. I do. I talk psychology, so I'm like, are we winning, America? <laughs> <laughs> and America's like, its face is melting. <laughs> Or it's like, you know, doing something perverted uh, in a dark room on the internet <laughs> as, as a leftist kind of opens the door and goes like, are you winning? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or maybe it's China. China walks in and goes like, are you winning, America? There you go. <laughs> uh, that's good. All right. So, yeah. So that is my podcast. I, I put it mostly it every week. Through community radio, I record on community radio. I am part of the manage- management team, um, which is now pretty active now. In fact, we actually had our first crisis where the station went down, and through our committee system of volunteers, we were able to resolve it oh. without getting involved. Board of the nonprofit that we're a project of. Well, yeah, there you go, and, that, and that's how it's supposed to work in a mm-hmm. more community-run sort of. Horizontalism in practice. Yeah, well, that's great. But you still need underliners like myself to say, okay, let's have a meeting sure. this time. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who can make it? You have to have some structure still. No, no doubt about that. Well, thank you very much for, for joining me again tonight. Uh, I did have a lot of fun going through all those uh, videos tonight. And, and yeah, who knows where we'll go next time. And, um, yep. But I definitely do this want to again keep this series weeks. going. Uh, gives me life. What, what was that? What was the last thing you said? I said we'll do this every few weeks. Gives me life. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, look, look for uh, another edition of New Urbanist Memes in in the future and a future Sunday show. Uh, but until then, uh, thanks very much, Dan, and uh, have a great night. I will. Good night. All right, so that was Dan Platt of the Three Lefts Show. So you can go check out his stuff there at threelefts.news. And uh, check out the, that's kind of the, the home base for uh, the channel. And you can always check out my stuff on, uh, if you go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash bread underscore theory. And you have links to all my Twitch, my YouTube, my podcast, uh, Facebook presence where I... I usually post uh, what time I'm going live and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's just another way to keep up with the show, the live show. I fixed that link for the Left Signal Boost database. There we go. That's the one that it's supposed to do. So this is a, a, a crowdsourced database of, of all sort of leftist, leftist content creators. Um, so if you, for example, you're interested in YouTube, and finding some new leftist creators to follow. There's an A to Z list um, that people have, you know, got it, that people have uh, put together. And we're up to, let's see, 
306 entries just for the the YouTube leftist YouTube channels right now. So there's there's always something new to check out. Uh, try to categorize things in terms of just general leftist, socialist, uh, ML, progressive liberal, uh, anarchist, any of those sorts of things to to help you search through to to find what you're looking for. And uh, people often put in short descriptions and and other links to the channel as well. A really great resource you can check out, though. So no matter what sort of media you're into, uh, there's there's something that you can can find uh, more information about about uh, leftist creators. Uh, and one that's been growing recently is is the left Twitch. So people have just been going in and adding new entries, and we're up to yeah. I, I know I'm interacting that way. Uh, we're up to 74 entries for, for leftist Twitch. So it's definitely a growing category on, on the platform. It's, it's really great to see that, but it can always be hard, especially when you're starting out in a, in a new medium to find people doing the, the sort of things that, that you like to talk about and think about and, and, uh, become a part of the community for, but so this is just one more resource you can use. Again, by going to uh, my link tree there. I think that's going to do it for me tonight. I really do got to get to bed, and I'm late for that. But thank you all very much for, for joining me tonight. Um, I really did have a lot of fun going through those memes, and I hope that you've... Uh, I hope that you felt it was worth your while to, to get into a little more ideas of, of new urbanism along with me. So we'll go ahead and raid into, uh, I think, Mad Madame Defarge tonight. It's been a while since we've raided her. Looks like she's playing a interesting crafting video game. So that'll be nice, but she's a, another leftist Twitch streamer and always has interesting comment er, content and, and a really cool community as well. So I'll go ahead and say Lectem tonight for everybody. And I will hopefully see you all this upcoming uh, this upcoming Friday, where we will be doing part two, the, the conclusion of the principles of communism.